In this section, we're going to talk about the principles behind the operation of an alignment telescope. Specifically, what we will be talking about are what are called auto-reflections, and we will differentiate those with another uh, type of reflection called the retro-reflection. The prefix auto means self. So for example, automobile is a device that gets around by itself. Automatic is something that takes care of itself. Auto-reflections are reflections that come right back on themselves. Probably the most famous auto-reflection that most people are aware of that work in an optics lab is auto-collimation, which is simply a collimated beam that comes back on itself. As an example of that, consider figure A over here. Let's assume that we have a point source of light which produces a diverging cone and goes through some kind of an optical system represented here by this lens and produces a collimated beam of light. If we have a flat mirror that's perpendicular to the optical axis of this optical system, then what will happen is the point source will diverge, come out of the lens collimated, hit this flat mirror at normal incidence, and come back on itself, ray for ray, because the uh, flat mirror is perpendicular to the optical axis, the, uh, uh, the beam will come back and converge down right on top of the output point source. Now notice that I mentioned here that auto-reflections are tilt sensitive. What that means is, is that if I take this flat mirror and tip or tilt it, the collimated beam will still remain collimated, but will come into the optical system at some angle other than zero degrees. The result of that is, is that when the return image comes to a focus, that focused image could be above or below or to the left and right of the emanating point source. There are some other examples of auto-reflections besides auto-collimation. As you can see here, we're achieving an auto-reflection with a concave surface, and over here, we're achieving auto-reflection with a convex surface. Let's talk about the concave surface first. Let's say that this is a spherical surface, and the center of curvature of this spherical surface is located right here. Because this is a sphere, any line that goes through the center of curvature will hit the surface at normal incidence and will therefore come back on itself. So if our alignment telescope here has a point source, and that point source is being focused at this point in space, and if this point in space happens to be coincident with the center of curvature of this surface, then the beam will come back right it will come right back on itself and then refocus right back at the original point. And because auto-reflections are tilt sensitive, if I tilt this mirror up or down or left and right, the return image will accordingly move over here. This is repeated for a convex surface. In this case, I have a convex surface whose center of curvature is located here. And I have my alignment telescope adjusted so that the point source is focusing down to a place that is exactly coincident with the center of curvature of this surface. As a result, all of these converging rays are hitting the convex surface at normal incidence, so they will come back on themselves, that is, auto-reflect, and return back to the point source right here. And once again, if this surface is tipped or tilted, the return image will come back either above or below or to the left or the right of this uh, originating point source. The other type of reflection that we'll notice when we're using the alignment telescope is the so-called retroreflection. This is also an important type of reflection to be aware of whenever you are using an alignment telescope. Once again, we start with our point source and light is diverging through an optical system represented here by a single lens, but this is really our alignment telescope. 
The beam is converging to a focus, and now there is an optical surface located right at the focus of the point source. Let's say for a moment that we have a flat surface and that that flat surface, the, the normal of that flat surface is perpendicular to the optical axis. Because angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, a ray emanating from this point source following this path will come down, hit this surface, reflect, and retrace a mirror imaged path back to the point source. Notice that this mirrored image path is not an auto reflection because auto means self and the ray is not returning on itself. It's returning along a mirrored path. There are some very important consequences of such a reflection. Because the image of this point, because the image of this point is conjugate to the original source. That means that any ray that diverges from this point, regardless of the angle at which it comes off, will be imaged back on top of the original point source. Therefore, if I take this flat mirror and I tip it at some angle, even though a ray coming in, say, in this direction is now reflecting off in that direction. If the aperture of the telescope was, was tall enough to capture that ray, it would still focus down to this point. So one thing that we notice is, is that as we tip and tilt the surface, the image stays fixed. However, as this surface tips an enormous amount, eventually this entire cone will start rotating about this point until the entire cone of light will miss the aperture of the alignment telescope. No light will get back to this point and there therefore will be no return image. And so one thing that we can, one thing that we will observe is that we have a point source, a point source over here that's imaged by retroreflection back on itself. And as we tip the surface, Nothing will happen. As we tip it more, the image will start to dim. And as we tip it more still, there will be no light coming back at all. Before we actually look at a real alignment telescope, I'd like to show you this schematic and walk through it so we know what to expect when we look at the actual telescope. First thing we, we observe is that the alignment telescope consists of a centerless ground steel barrel. The mechanical axis of this barrel is held to the optical axis within a few arc seconds. You'll see an eyepiece on the alignment telescope. And inside of that eyepiece, there is a crosshair shown schematically here. Because everybody's eyes are slightly different and because it's very important to have the crosshair clearly in focus for your particular eye, a knurled knob at the top of the eyepiece is provided so that you can focus the crosshair until it's in sharp focus. One thing I should caution is that there are more than one person in the lab and if lots of people are looking into the eyepiece, everybody should take care to refocus the crosshair so it's in focus for their particular vision. I'll also be pointing out to you a knob that's located on the back of the alignment telescope. What you won't be able to see is inside of the alignment telescope there is a bullseye pattern that will be illuminated by a light source. This bullseye pattern will be imaged through the lens system that's located in this barrel off someplace in space. The exact position of the image of this bullseye pattern in space is set by the rotation of this knob. If this knob is rotated completely clockwise, then the bullseye pattern will be focused at infinity. 
if this knob is focused completely counterclockwise, then the bullseye pattern will be focused a short distance in front of the alignment telescope. Uh, in the case of the alignment telescope that we will be discussing, that distance is about 16 inches. The alignment telescope will be set on top of these so-called cone mounts. These cone mounts are actually four cone mounts. As you can see, there are two cones at the front end of the barrel, and there are two cones located at the back of the barrel. These cones have a 90 degree apex angle, and each one is adjustable by a, uh, a large fine thread screw shown here. If we look at a front end of the alignment telescope, we see that the ground circular or cylindrical barrel sits tangent onto these cones at two points, here and here. If I screw this cone upward, what it does is, is it constrains the tangent point right here to move along this 45 degree line. These cones provide all of the degrees of freedom necessary to adjust the telescope. For example, if we take all four cones and screw them upward by the same amount, that would result in a net vertical translation of the alignment telescope. If we want to move the alignment telescope in the horizontal direction, what we do is we take the two cones on the right side and say screw them upward. That forces the center point of the alignment telescope to move at a 45 degree angle parallel to this edge. If we then take these two cones and screw them downward by the same number of turns that we screwed these upward, then the, the uh, optical axis of the alignment telescope will move down at a 45 degree angle and the result will be a net horizontal translation. Notice that I have shown schematically in the eyepiece not only this crosshair which is focused in the eyepiece, but I also show this bullseye pattern. This bullseye pattern is the return image of the illuminated bullseye that's sitting inside of the body of the alignment telescope. The way we see this return image is through one of the various auto-reflections or retro-reflections. I'll show a simple example here, and then we, we will show all of the examples when we're actually using the actual alignment telescope. Let's say that this knob is adjusted to infinity. What that means is that the bullseye pattern will be focused at infinity. Let's say that I take a flat mirror and locate it right in front of the alignment telescope with the normal to that flat mirror along the axis of the optical axis of the alignment telescope. If the bullseye pattern is projected out to infinity, then what will happen is, is that the collimated beam leaving the alignment telescope from the point source located at the center of the bullseye pattern will hit that flat mirror at normal incidence, just like the autocollimation view graph I showed previously, that image will return on its auto-reflected path. This beam splitter will pick up that return image, and the bullseye pattern will be located exactly centered on the crosshair. If I now tilt or tip the flat mirror that's located in front of the, in front of the alignment telescope, then this bullseye pattern will move around. Here we have an alignment telescope sitting on a set of cone mounts. First I want to talk about some of the features of the alignment telescope itself. Then we'll go through a discussion of the cone mounts. We'll discuss a little bit about how the alignment telescope is adjusted. And then set up a flat mirror and align it to the alignment telescope using the principles of autocollimation. For safety reasons, we have a set of hold downs that are removable to prevent the alignment telescope from tipping 
and falling off of the cones. As you can see here, this is the centerless ground steel barrel. It has its mechanical axis aligned coincident to the optical axis of the lens groups that are sitting in here to an accuracy of about three arc seconds. The particular model that we're talking about here is a Davidson model D275 alignment telescope. Up here is the eyepiece with the knurled focusing knob to get the crosshair in focus for your particular vision. Once that crosshair is in focus, you can move the knob back here, which takes the bullseye pattern located inside of this unit and projects it any place from infinity down to a minimum distance of about 16 inches away. There's an arrow on the back of this knob that shows the direction of infinity and when you simply rotate it until it stops, you've reached that position. The bullseye pattern is illuminated with a light source that fits in here. Sometimes for optics, optical surfaces that have anti-reflection coatings on them, uh, the amount of light that you want to return uh, needs to be greater. And so sometimes what can be done is you can remove this light source and you can carefully place a fiber bundle array with a high intensity source in here and lock it into position. One thing that's nice about the cone mounts is that they comprise a kinematic mount. So if you're aligning optics that are large in extent, let's say in a room, rather than placing the alignment telescope at one end of the room where the optics are getting progressively further and further away, you can put the alignment telescope in the middle of the room align the optics, say, in this direction, carefully pick up the alignment telescope, rotate it around 180 degrees, and gently lower it back onto the cone mounts, and the optical axis remains established in the same direction, and I can now align optical components on this side of the room. Another feature of the alignment telescope I would like to point out is a CCD camera, which we will shortly mount right above the eyepiece. The CCD camera will be attached to a TV monitor so that rather than only one person looking through the eyepiece at a time, everybody in the room that's assisting in the alignment can monitor the position of the bullseye pattern on the crosshairs and make adjustments as necessary to achieve the alignment. One last thing I'd well, one last thing I'd like to mention about the alignment telescope is that clearly it can rotate on the cone mounts. Uh, this actually can be an advantage. If I take the alignment telescope on the cone mounts and I rotate them towards you like this, you can see that these are the 40, these are the cones with the 90 degree apex angle that I mentioned. If I lower this alignment, uh, this cone, and raise this cone. I can affect various adjustments up front. I can do the same thing in the back. Because the tangent points are at 90 degrees to each other, but at 45 degrees to the vertical, one trick is, is that you can rotate the alignment telescope so that the eyepiece is at a 45 degree angle. And then, when you adjust the cones, the alignment telescope is moving at plus or minus 40 degrees to the vertical and horizontal planes. But because the eyepiece is rotated at 45 degrees, the crosshairs are rotated at 45 degrees to the vertical and horizontal planes. And it looks like the alignment telescope, as I make these adjustments, are moving right along the two crosshairs. We now have the alignment telescope set up with the CCD camera. And as you can see, uh, the video monitor is on, and we don't see anything. We have a flat mirror sitting over here, and our initial goal is to take the alignment telescope, set it for autocollimation, and adjust this flat mirror 
until the normal to the surface of this mirror is parallel to the optical axis of the alignment telescope. The field of view of the alignment telescope is relatively small. It's about a half a degree. And so because this mirror can be tilted any place, if we simply started to look through it and wildly started tipping the mirror around, like a lot of people do when they get into the lab, uh, we might be shooting for a needle in a haystack. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to not start with the auto-reflection. We're going to start with the retro-reflection. As you can see from the retro-reflection slide, the bullseye pattern is now going to be focused on the surface of the mirror. We're going to look at the return image. And regardless of how the flat mirror is tilted, the retroreflection pattern is going to be exactly on the center of the crosshair. The only difference is, is if the flat mirror is tilted a very large amount, the illumination of the bullseyes will not be uniform. Now, the question is, how do we know when the alignment telescope is focused? Now we'll switch out of the retroreflection. Now that we've seen the schematic of the retroreflection, the question is, what is an easy way to determine that the alignment telescope is actually focused on the surface of the mirror? The way to do that is you take a card, any piece of paper. Now, obviously, whether or not you can touch the optical surface is dependent on how critical these optics are in the lab. This is a test flat that we use at our company all the time. Uh, it's got dust on it. I'm not terribly worried about putting a mark on it, but obviously if this was a flight optical component, you'd have to be more concerned about it. What I'm going to do is put this business card on the surface, and now if you look at the monitor, you can see that there's clearly something moving. I'm going to take the alignment telescope and focus it away from infinity, and I can now begin to see the fibers on the business card. When I take, those five, when I take the card away, I am now close enough to being in retro reflection that I begin to see the bullseye pattern. And what I do is simply adjust. And now I see both the crosshair of the eyepiece and the bullseye pattern produced by the illuminated reticle in the field of view. Now notice that the bullseye pattern is absolutely concentric with the crosshair. And you think, gee, we must have set this up in the lab in advance. But remember that in the case of a retroreflection, no matter how you tilt the flat mirror, it's always going to be aligned. So to prove that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust a knob on the back of the flat mirror, and I'm going to adjust this by tipping the mirror vertically. As I tip the mirror vertically and we look at the bullseye pattern, we see that the centration is not changing. It's just that the relative illumination is beginning to change. Now, it's going slightly out of focus because of the nature of this mount, and I'll address that later on. But the point is, I'm turning this quite a bit. Now, I don't know if, if you can see that the mirror is actually tilting enough that you can appreciably see the amount that the mirror is tilting. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the horizontal motion. I'm going to move this in the horizontal direction, and you can see the mirror is tipping by quite a bit. And all I'm doing is I'm changing the relative illumination. So the trick then is you take the alignment telescope and you focus on the mirror. The way you focus on the mirror is you put a business card there. You focus on the business card or some, some sheet of paper or mylar or something that's lint-free. That lets you know that you're very close to the retroreflection. And then you simply adjust the tip of the mirror until the illumination pattern is relatively uniform, just like we have here. Now, once the illumination is relatively uniform, that means that the tilt of the flat mirror is within a limit that the autocollimation beam should be within the field of view of the alignment telescope. Now, in, in looking at the uh, in looking at the autoreflection slide we see that that first figure, figure A, is that of autocollimation. And this is what we're going to simulate now with the alignment telescope. I'm going to take the focusing knob of the alignment telescope, and I'm going to depart from this retroreflected bullseye pattern. And I'm going to go towards infinity. 
until I see the second bullseye pattern which is the bullseye pattern produced in autocollination. Now clearly the alignment is off and if you remember unlike retro reflections which are tilt insensitive the auto reflections are tilt sensitive. So when I tilt this flat mirror it should be very easy to move this, move this bullseye pattern. I tilt it vertically. I tilt it horizontally. Each ring represents an error of about one arc minute. And the little dot in the middle subtends an angle of, I think, about five arc seconds. And so the goal is to try and get that little dot centered on the crosshair. Now it turns out that the angular subtense of the dot is slightly larger than the angular subtense of the crosshairs. And so theoretically, it's possible to have the autocollimation adjusted so that when the dot is behind the crosshair, you'll see a little bit of light from the dot sneaking through into each quadrant produced by the crosshair. I don't know if the camera has the resolution to do that or not. We're going to try that. Cut the image in half that way. And we've split the image. So now the alignment telescope is set for infinity. That collimated beam is hitting the flat mirror. And the flat mirror is now square with the optical axis of the alignment telescope to a, a couple of arc seconds, probably one or two arc seconds. And we can see that because the, the dot is now split by the crosshairs in both directions. And that's how we achieve autocollimation. Just to review it one more time, we start off and we don't really know where the alignment telescope is focusing. We place something up at or near the surface. We adjust until the alignment telescope is focusing on that object, in this case a business card. We take the card away and we can now easily find the retro reflection, which is always centered. We adjust the flat mirror until the illumination is uniform. Then we know that we're squared on sufficiently that we're within the field of view in the auto reflection mode. We crank the alignment telescope to infinity. The crosshairs and the bullseye pattern are both in focus. And the little dot at the center of the bullseye pattern is right behind the crosshair. And we've achieved a very accurate autocollimation. Another aspect of aligning an alignment telescope is that sometimes we want to make sure that the axis of the alignment telescope is pointing, is, is co coaxial with the optical axis of the optical system. Now, in the example of the flat mirror, we didn't have to really worry about that because the flat has an infinite number of normals across the surface, any one of which we can, when we tilt the flat mirror, we can just pick any one normal, get the alignment telescope normal to that, and the entire flat mirror is normal to the axis of the alignment telescope, except it may not be centered. If we have a lens or, say, uh, a telescope tube with a crosshair in it, and we want to establish both perpendicularity uh, of the alignment telescope axis to that tube, and we also want to achieve centration or coincidence of the alignment telescope's axis to the tube axis, we also have to worry about the actual displacement. Now, the actual displacement is going to be a function of how far away the alignment telescope is from the object. What I've done to show you the kind of accuracy that you can expect is I've taken a steel rule that's marked in one hundredth of an inch increments. I've placed the alignment telescope close to its minimum allowable working distance of 16 inches. And I have focused the alignment telescope near the retroreflection condition, as you can see 
on the bullseye pattern. You can see the bullseye pattern in focus just behind the steel rule. And when I make a slight adjustment in focus, you can see the tick marks. Now, each one of those tick marks is a hundredth of an inch separation from the other. I think you can easily see, as I adjust the alignment telescope, you'll see that the crosshair of the, you'll see the crosshair of the alignment telescope moving relative to the crosshair, the, uh, the tick marks on the ruler. And I think you would agree that the resolution is at least one-fifth of that separation, making it two thousandths of an inch or two mils. And perhaps you can convince yourself you can do better than that. So at the minimum working distance of about 16 inches, one can expect a translational positioning accuracy of the alignment telescope in the order of one or two mils. That tolerance will decrease as the alignment telescope moves further back. What we do when we're putting a system together is if the translational accuracy is important, wherever the alignment telescope is, we take a moment and put the steel rule there and gauge what kind of translational positioning accuracy we can expect for that distance. We've made a few modifications and we've taken the flat mirror away. And what I'd like to do now is to show you not an auto collimation, which is what you would produce off of a flat mirror. I want to show you an auto reflection off of a convex surface. I have a meniscus lens here, fairly large, with a big convex surface on this side. Unlike the flat mirror, which was aluminized, this is a bare glass surface. So I'm only receiving a 4% reflection. So I have 25 times less light than I did before. I've added a high intensity fiber light, in part because with the room lights on, in order to photograph this, we lose some contrast. So I need to boost it by using the fiber bundle. But the procedure is essentially the same. I've located this lens at least 16 inches away from the alignment telescope. And what I would like to do is I would like to find the auto-reflected image. So I always start with the retro-reflected image, like we said before. So I take a card, and I set it in place. I look at the monitor that's viewing through the eyepiece, and I focus until I can see the filaments in the business card, just like that. I take the card away, and now I can see the retroreflected image off of the surface of the lens. It's always suspicious that you have the retroreflected image because miraculously it's always absolutely centered. You would not expect that kind of luck just aligning an autoreflected image. One way to verify it, however, is to gently, and I repeat gently, grab the alignment telescope and just slightly jiggle it around. And you'll see that the bullseye pattern is staying absolutely centered. Okay? Now, because this is a convex surface, the center of curvature of this surface is located somewhere behind the lens. That means that in order to reach that point, I want to begin focusing my alignment telescope towards infinity. Now, I begin focusing towards infinity, and with just a small amount of motion, I see this other bullseye pattern. If I take the alignment telescope and move the alignment telescope around, we can see that there's a whole bunch of stuff in the background that's moving, but the bullseye pattern is staying absolutely consistent, constant. The reason is, is that we're now, what we're now doing is, is we're focusing in a at a position such that when the converging beam from the alignment telescope is being refracted by the front surface of the lens, the bullseye pattern is focused exactly on the, surf on the convex surface of this lens, which is on the back surface. So I am achieving a second retroreflection. Normally, you wouldn't see that. 
because if the alignment telescope was very far away from the lens and if the lens was very thin, the difference in the depth of focus between the front surface and the back surface would be so small that you would essentially see both bullseye patterns at the same time. That's not the case here. You can see a bunch of stuff in the image that looks uh, kind of messed up, and there's also a vertical line. It turns out that this mount is made out of plexiglass. It's badly scratched up. And the distance from the concave surface to the plexiglass is within the depth of focus of the alignment telescope. So we're actually seeing the imperfections and a vertical line on the mount superimposed with the retro-reflected image off of the back of the lens. Now, as I continue to focus to infinity, I will eventually reach a point where the alignment telescope is focusing in the plane that's the plane of the center of curvature of the convex surface. As I slowly go through focus, I suddenly see that plane. Now, I know it's not a retroreflection because when I lightly hold the telescope and move it around, it's clear that that image is moving, and so it must be an autoreflection rather than a retroreflection. And I can go ahead and adjust the cones of the alignment telescope. until the center of the bullseye pattern is lined up. Now what I'd like to do is discuss where the alignment telescope is pointing relative to the lens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the retroreflected image. which is right here. And I'm going to take the tip of my card now if you look at the lens you can see that the tip of my card is not really centered on the lens. The center of the lens is more like over here. All right. The significance of that is, is that because this is a spherical surface, as long as the spherical surface is pivoting about its center of curvature, I will always get this autoreflection. Well, I'll always get the autoreflection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the autoreflection. And I'm going to take this mount, and I'm going to push it sideways, and then rotate it. And push it sideways, and rotate it. And I'm going to keep doing that. And you can see how dramatically I'm tilting the lens. I'll even move it some more. And I'll refocus slightly. center. What I've done is the combination of decentration and rotation has allowed me to, to rotate this convex surface about its center of curvature. And because of that, the optical axis of the alignment telescope will always hit that surface normal regardless of the rotation of this surface about its center of curvature. That's one of the properties of a, of a spherical surface. And so what it says is, is that if I'm trying to align a lens, simply aligning the convex surface to the alignment telescope is not sufficient. Because all I've done is, is that I have, I have, I have moved the lens so that the optical axis of the alignment telescope is hitting some portion of that surface at normal incidence. That doesn't mean that the optical axis of the lens is lined up. We'll demonstrate that next. What I'd like to do now is to uh, show you a trick to help 
locate the optical axis of a mirror by finding and marking in space where the center of curvature of that mirror is. Let's assume that we have a concave mirror. That concave mirror has a center of curvature located someplace over here. If we take a pin or a pencil uh, or any kind of uh, object with a little point on it and we place it approximately at the center of curvature, there will be a one-to-one -one return image approximately in that vicinity and that return image will be inverted. If I take my head and I move it anywhere from 14 plus inches away so that I, it allows me to focus my eye in this region and if I close one eye, this is very important, you close one eye and you look over the pin, you will see the return image inverted someplace in the vicinity. I now take the actual uh, pin and I move it up and down, left and right, and I can eventually adjust it until the, the, the tip of the pin and the return image appear to be tip to tip just like they appear in this figure. I don't have, because I'm using one eye, I don't have sufficient information to tell whether or not the pin is at the center of curvature or whether it's too far in, inboard or too far outboard and then likewise for the return image. But then what I can do is, is I can take my eyeball, my head, and I can look over this pin and I can change my viewing angle. Now, in, normally you would do this in the horizontal plane. In fact, these figures show it doing in the horizontal plane. But just imagine in the vertical plane, if I raise my head and look down from my eyeball to the tip of the pin, down to the bottom of the mirror, and then if I lowered my head, so I went from the tip from my eyeball to the tip of the pin to the top of the mirror. As I move my head up and down like that, the tip of the pin would appear to move across the surface of the mirror. Now, I just gave an example for moving your head up and down, but in fact, you would really want to move it from left to right. It's just more convenient. And if the tip of the pin is at the center of curvature of the mirror, then the tip of the image will be superimposed right on top of it. And as I move my head back and, back and forth, I will see both the pin and the image sweep across the mirror, and they will stay tip to tip the entire way. If I'm not at the focus, if, say, as in this example, the pin is inside of the center of curvature and the image is on the outside of the center of curvature, as I move back and forth, I will see a parallax effect and I'll see the image of the pin and the image, uh, I'll see the pin and its image separate from each other as I sweep across. We'll now look at a real example of this. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to actually locate a pin at the center of curvature of a concave mirror. I have over here a 12 inch diameter concave mirror. We're going to place a pin at its center of curvature. I've located the tip of a pen approximately at the center of curvature. And in order for you to actually observe this, we're going to substitute my eye for a digital camera. Now notice the digital camera is sitting there and is focused on the back side of the pen. It will also record the inverted image of the pen in approximately the same location. And then what we will do is, is we will uh, adjust the position of the pen uh, both side to side, height wise, and in focus, and rotate the camera about the tip of the pen and watch the two images move across the mirror. Once they no longer separate, as they sweep across the mirror, we know we've located the center of curvature. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, use the camera as a substitute for our eyeball, and we'll go ahead and try and align the pin at the center of curvature of the mirror.
A few things I need to point out first. The 12 inch diameter mirror is shown in the background and you can see we've got a hand there that's going around the periphery of the mirror. Uh, clearly it's difficult for the camera to focus both on the pin which is near us and on the mirror which is further away. So you can see that there is the outside of the 12 inch diameter mirror. Now the actual pin is located right here. The inverted image is located right here. And now as I move the pin in one direction, the return inverted image moves in the opposite direction, just like that. For simplicity, I've located the height of the pin uh, just right, so we don't have to mess with that adjustment. But if I wanted to, I could raise the pin up and down, and you can see it moving just like that. So the first thing that we do is, is we adjust the pin so the return image is sitting right above it. And then what we'd like to do is we want to verify whether or not they're both actually in the same plane. So now I'm going to take the entire camera and rotate it as best as I can around the tip of the pin. Now if you notice, you can see in the, in the mirror, you can see this, ap this square aperture here which is the baffle of the camera, and the aperture of the lens is sitting right behind the pin. In reality, if I had my head there instead of the camera, you would actually see reflected in the mirror your eyeball, and if your eyeball was in a position such that the tip of the pin and the tip of the image were just touching the way they are right now, the pupil of your eye would be right at the intersection of those two tips. So here we go, it looks like it's aligned, but now I'm going to rotate the camera about the center of curvature of the pin. And as you can see, the image hardly moved. So we're actually pretty close to focus. What I'm going to do now is deliberately move the, the pin towards me, and now the images still look tip to tip, but as I rotate, you can see now that as the tip of the pin is now looking right at the edge of the mirror, the return image is separated. As I sweep across and reach the center of the mirror, the pin is tip to tip, as you might expect, and then as I rotate to the other side, once again the image and the actual pin itself separate. So now what I'll do is I'll return to the central neutral position and I'll refocus. And let's see if that works. Looks a lot better. but I'm still not there. So I'll move it a little bit more. And as you can see, the image and the tip stay relatively concentric as we sweep across. Now, if you were to use your eyeball, you are limited by the resolution of your eyeball at a distance of 14 or 20 inches or so, however much you choose to go to move back. If you're nearsighted, you'll be able to have your eye a little bit closer and your uh, resolution will be better. If you're farsighted like I am, you'll have to keep your head a little further away and your angular resolution will be diminished. Now, once you get it uh, to this accuracy, if you want to improve the accuracy, you can actually go up to the pin with an eye loop and look at it with a magnifying glass and then look at the return image. We can actually simulate that uh, with this camera by zooming in. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in now on the pin and refocus.
And now you can actually see that the tip of both the pin and the image are splitting the aperture of the camera lens located right there. Okay, so now we're looking at under higher magnification. And we see the edge of the mirror right there. If you move the finger, you can see where the edge of the mirror is. And we come across the other way, all the way to the other side of the mirror. And you can see that the, the pin and the image actually stay in pretty good focus. And so basically, you can uh, use higher and higher magnification eye loops. You can replace the eye loop with a magnifying glass if you want, or a microscope even, and, uh, and get the position of the pin very, very precisely at the center of curvature. What we'll now do is show how this is useful in an alignment setup. What I'd like to do, do now is discuss the alignment procedure for rotationally symmetric surfaces. These would be an aspheric, such as a parabola, hyperbola, ellipse, or higher order aspheric. If you recall, if this surface was a spherical surface, it would have an infinite number of optical axes. That is to say, any line that goes through the center of curvature will intersect the surface at normal incidence and come right back onto itself. However, in the case of an asphere, such as a parabola, it is actually uh, a surface of rotational symmetry about a single optical axis. What we'd like to do is to get the optical axis of that surface coaxial with the optical axis of the alignment telescope. There are two ways to do that. The first is to manipulate the mirror until the optical axis is on the axis of the alignment telescope. In that case, what we are doing is, is we're saying that the alignment telescope is going to remain fixed, and the optical axis of the alignment telescope is going to be the reference axis to which we place the, alignment, the uh, optical axis of the parabola to the required accuracy. The way to do that is shown in the figure. Here what we do is, is we first take the alignment telescope and focus it on the surface of the mirror. And we want to move the mirror horizontally and vertically until the optical axis is on the alignment telescope's axis. The question is, how do we do that? Because there's nothing that normally marks where the vertex of this mirror is. We have to put some kind of a mark there. The way we would normally do that is to place a mask over the mirror that has a crosshair or a pinhole marked at the center. In order for that to be accurate, we have to be assured that the mechanical axis of the edge of the mirror is coaxial with the optical axis of the parabola. The way we would do that is to make sure that the drawings that are used by the optician in the fabrication of this optic specify the accuracy to which that is achieved. Then what we can do is we can make a, uh, a mask that fits over the periphery with that crosshair. The alignment telescope is focused down into this region and the eye here will view the fixed crosshair that's in the eyepiece and the mark, such as another crosshair, that's on the mask. And then what we do is adjust the mirror vertically and horizontally until this crosshair is coincident with the crosshair in the eyepiece. The next step would be to take the alignment telescope, turn on the light source, and project the bullseye pattern that we saw earlier into space in the vicinity of the paraxial center of curvature of this mirror. 
in which case the bullseye pattern located here would be re-imaged one to one and come back on itself and then be re-imaged by the alignment telescope and if the, the center of curvature of the mirror was right on the optical axis of the alignment telescope then the bullseye pattern would be centered in the crosshair. Since two points determine a line and we have now positioned two points of this mirror, namely the vertex of the mirror and the center of curvature of the mirror on this optical axis, we have achieved the alignment of these two axes. Now I would like to review the second method for aligning the optical axis of the mirror to the alignment telescope's axis. In this second method, we assume that the, the mirror is fixed. There are lots of reasons for this. The mirror could already be in some kind of an assembly, or the mirrors can simply be physically too large to be able to, to, be able to simply decenter and tilt it. In which case, we now make use of the cone mounts located underneath the alignment telescope. The procedure is as follows. We take the alignment telescope and focus it down onto the crosshair, which is, which is located on the mask that we talked about previously. We're going to use these adjustments in order to get the crosshair in the eyepiece of the alignment telescope superimposed on the crosshair on this mask. The other step that's going to be required is when the alignment telescope has its illuminated bullseye pattern focused near the center of curvature of the mirror, we're going to look, we, we will be observing the return bullseye pattern and we want to adjust these cone mounts so that that bullseye pattern is centered on the crosshair. Then as a double check, we take the alignment telescope and focus back onto the crosshairs of the mask make sure they're still in the same location and then on to the uh, near the center of curvature so that we can look at the bullseye pattern and make sure it's centered as well. Now the way to do that is through an iterative process and I would like to go through that iterative process now carefully. If you notice there are several ways we can adjust these cone mounts. If we take all four cone mounts and raise them or lower them, we raise or lower the entire optical axis of the alignment telescope. If, say, we raise the two cone mounts that are on one side of the alignment telescope, and then as we go around the back, we lower the two cones that are on the other side, we produce a net left to right translation. If we simply move the front two cones and not the back two cones, we affect a tilt of the alignment telescope. We need to adjust, make these adjustments in a methodical manner so that we can converge onto the alignment very quickly. So let's see how we do that. The first thing that we notice is, is that the center of curvature of the mirror is always going to be closer to the alignment telescope than the vertex of the mirror. As a result, if I raise or lower, say, the front cone mounts up and down, I will cause a much greater change in the position of the optical axis of the alignment telescope on the mirror than I will near the center of curvature. In fact, let's say that the alignment telescope is located about 16 inches away from the center of curvature, and it's located 160 inches away from the mirror, then when I tilt these cones, the amount of motion that I see in this position it will only be one-tenth of the amount of motion I see in this position. So the rule is going to be that whenever we, the alignment telescope is looking at the mask, we are going to raise these cones up and down and tilt the alignment telescope. Then when the alignment telescope is looking at the center of curvature and we are observing the return bullseye pattern, we're going to take all four cones and either raise them or lower them the same amount in order to affect a translation error of the alignment telescope. And then we go back, focus the alignment telescope on the 
crosshair, perform the tilt, focus the alignment telescope at the center of curvature, and perform the decenter, and keep iterating until the alignment has been achieved to the required accuracy. We're now going to take the alignment telescope's optical axis and adjust it until it's coaxial with the, with the optical axis of this parabola that's sitting at the other end of the laboratory table. Now, if we look at the parabola, you see that what we've done is we placed a crosshair centered on the optical surface. One thing I'd like to mention is, is that during the course of this video, you'll see that we're using pens for the center of curvature, strings for the mirror, and I'm doing that deliberately. I'm doing that deliberately to show you that you don't have to have extremely expensive equipment to efficiently align an optical system. I don't want to mislead you by using the absolute best equipment to make you think that that's what you need to do the alignment. What I want to do is calm you down and show you that uh, just strings and pens are good enough to actually do a pretty good job. Now, in the case of this string, I really don't know if it's on the optical axis of that mirror or not. Um, we didn't deliberately make a mask for this. Uh, and the reason we didn't do that is for the purposes of this demonstration, to show you the principles of operation of the alignment telescope, it really wasn't necessary to do that. But if this was a parabola going into a real optical system, say with other optical components, where there was an ultimate overall performance requirement needed, then you would have to make sure that the edge of the mirror was edged down properly, that its mechanical center was coaxial with the optical axis, and that these crosshairs were indeed centered within the proper tolerance. Now, here's the, the pen that uh, we've already demonstrated, and we use this to find the center of curvature. So it's nice now because by looking at the pen, we can approximately see where our optical axis is. The alignment telescope is going, the, the optical axis of the alignment telescope is going to have to be brought into coincidence with a line that is approximately from the tip of this pen to the crosshair of the mirror. One of the things that's important when you're doing optical alignment is to align to a foot, an inch, a millimeter, a mil, and then a micron. You always try and rough things in gradually. You don't try to align things to a thousandth of an inch the very first time. And so one of the purposes of, the, of this pin demonstration is to help us rough align the alignment telescope. If you look at the monitor, if you look at the monitor, you can see that when the bullseye pattern is focused in the same plane, I'm going to just move my hand here, you can see it, in the same plane as the pin, I can see the inverted image of the pin, and I can see the bullseye pattern that is the return image of the bullseye pattern that is hovering in space here. That's the one-to-one -one image that's being reflected off of the parabola. When I take my alignment telescope and I focus it towards infinity until I'm focused on the surface of the parabola, we can see the uh, error between the crosshair in the alignment telescope and that of the string. We can also see the retro reflection on the surface of the mirror and the crosshair, which is always centered on that bullseye pattern, regardless of whether we're in alignment or not. So the goal is going to be to take the, the black crosshairs from the alignment telescope and get them coincident with the white crosshair produced by the string when the alignment telescope is focused on the surface of the mirror and simultaneously have the bullseye pattern that's near the center of curvature of the mirror also be centered on the black reticle pattern, the black crosshair pattern uh, that's in the eyepiece. I'd like to make a few more comments about the rough alignment procedure using the pin. Because this pin is sitting in space, we know where the tip is. When we set up the alignment telescope, 
the first thing that we do is focus the alignment telescope right onto the tip of the pin. Now, if you think about it, this alignment telescope can be located almost any place in space, and I can still point it to the pin. As an example, let's say that the alignment telescope's axis is located way up here. And I tilt the alignment telescope until it's pointing towards the center of curvature of the pin. Clearly, if I follow this line down, I'm going to run into the table. But because the optical alignment telescope has length to it, just like a rifle, I can actually sight down both the top and the side of the alignment telescope, just like I would, say, the gun sight on a gun, and see where in the distance the alignment telescope is pointing. So one of the nice features about having this pin here is if the alignment telescope is way up, way up here, and even though I'm looking at the pin, when I sight down the top of the alignment telescope, I see that it's not pointing to the mirror at all. What that tells me is, is I have to lower the alignment telescope and adjust its tilt. And when the alignment telescope is focused on the pin, and when I bore sight down the top of the barrel, I notice that the alignment telescope is approximately pointing to the center of the mirror, both in the left and right direction and in the vertical direction, then I've achieved a rough alignment that probably will be a sufficiently rough alignment to then use the adjustments on the alignment telescope itself. So when we look at the two uh, positions, namely with the, when the alignment telescope is focused near the center of curvature and when the alignment telescope is focused on the mirror, we notice that both bullseye patterns were within the field of view of the CCD camera. That means that the pin has now done its job for achieving the rough alignment. We don't need it anymore, and we can take it away. Before I do that, there's one other thing I want to show you. Watch what happens as I adjust the alignment telescope until the return bullseye pattern is on the horizontal axis. Notice that when the bullseye pattern is on the horizontal axis, the tip of the pin and the tip of the image of the pin are equally spaced above and below the optical axis. That's just the property of the symmetry of the return image. Okay, so I'll take the pin away. And now we're going to start aligning the system. All right, so we're now going to get this alignment telescope aligned to the optical axis of that parabola. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is see where we are. So let's take the alignment telescope and focus it on the crosshair. Well, I didn't really plan on having it so close to the center of the crosshair. It must have just shown up that way. Uh, but anyway, you can see where it is. And When I now take the alignment telescope and focus it back at the plane of the center of curvature, we see where we are. Now, it would be extremely tempting to simply tilt the alignment telescope to bring that image back on. Remember the rule. The rule is, is that when the alignment telescope is focused on the mirror, we make adjustments by tip. When the alignment telescope is focused near the center of curvature, which it is now, we make adjustments by decentration. But of course, you're not going to listen to me, and so what you're going to do is you're going to tip the alignment telescope very, very precisely to get the bullseye pattern right behind the crosshair. And then, of course, when you double check, Now we're off on the crosshair. So clearly that doesn't work. All right. So once again, we're going to adjust. Because we're looking at the crosshair, we're allowed to make adjustments by, by tilting. Then we go back and we look at the center curvature.
that's where we are. Now, probably at this, at this point, before you get too far involved, it would be useful to do a sanity check to see whether or not you think you have enough adjustments left in the cone mounts in order to get that correction. So if I take the pin, let's see if I can do this by hand. I shall do this. I'll take the, the steel rule. And I'll set it up. And you can see, because we're going to be decentering at the center, you know, when we're at the center curvature, it looks like we're maybe uh, about a tenth of an inch off in one direction. That should be a sufficiently small amount of motion that we should be able to correct it with the alignment cost. So the first thing we want to do is decenter in the horizontal direction. Okay, so uh, we're now going to get the alignment telescope's axis onto that of the mirrors. First thing we do is figure out where we are. So we'll take the alignment telescope and focus it on the surface of the mirror. And whenever we're looking at those crosshairs, we're going to adjust the front two cones for tipping. And adjust until we're fairly close. We don't have to be perfect right away. Now we're going to go back and examine the center of curvature. We see the bullseye pattern is about five rings too high and about four rings to the left. So let's work on the height first. I'm going to raise all four cones the same amount. All right. Um, my theory is, is that if we're looking at the return image, that means that the output image needs to be below. The output needs to be below. We need to raise the output, which will lower the return. So we'll just try one turn and see where we are. I'm going to, I'm going to raise all four cones. Now, we think that helped, but we don't know for sure until we focus on the crosshairs. Readjust the front slightly. It may be that we didn't, or that I didn't go exactly the right number of turns. Now we can go examine the image. And we've gone from about five rings down to two and a half rings. So let's go ahead and um, do that again. We're going to raise all four cones one more time. check. We'll make our adjustment. Always to the center.
and we're just about a ring away. So before we, remember, align to an inch, and then a millimeter, and then a mil. So before we try and get the vertical absolutely perfect, let's work on the horizontal motion as well. All right? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the alignment telescope and I'm move, going to the move it to the right. I'm going to move it this way. All right? In order for me to move it this way, I have to lower these two cones and I have to raise these two cones. So I'll lower these two cones first. I'll raise these two cones. Focus on the string. Make some slight adjustments. with the front cones. Go back and check the image at center of curvature. And we're homing in on it fairly well. So let's go ahead now and um, continue moving the alignment telescope to the right. But now let's do it just a half a turn. So I'm going to lower these two lower the lower the, the right the uh, the right side and raise the left side half a turn and raise these Look at the string. Make some minor adjustments. Okay, so we've removed the horizontal decentration to within Basically, the, uh, the uh, black uh, crosshair is touching the ring, the, the central dot. Okay, so we're within a few arc seconds. So now we want to adjust the vertical some more. So we want to come up, we want to come up a little bit. Let's try a quarter of a turn on all four of them. I'm going to raise all four up a quarter of a turn. Look at the string before we decide how well we did. Make some minor adjustments. Now, obviously, as we start getting closer and closer to getting this aligned perfectly, the minor adjustments become significant adjustments. So you have to keep that in mind. Now we can go back and see how well we did. And we're, we're now within a ring. So in the process of doing that, if we didn't exactly raise and lower the right amount, we're starting to drift uh, um, left and right now. Uh, so we can go ahead and, and take care of that. We'll just go down a little bit now. an eighth of a turn, and an eighth of a turn, and up an eighth of a turn, 
and up an eighth of a turn. Go back and look at the crosshair. That looks pretty good. Come back and do our evaluation. And now we just have a small vertical adjustment to make. So we're going to raise them all up a little bit. Let's try uh, about a quarter of a, of a, raise them all an eighth of a turn. Raise that an eighth of a turn. Raise that an eighth of a turn. Raise that an eighth of a turn. And now we're about a half a half a minute of arc away. So I don't need to get this perfect. I think what you can see is, is that it's an iterative process. We work on the vertical adjustment first, then the horizontal, then the vertical and the horizontal. It's not really worthwhile getting, say, the vertical adjustment or the horizontal adjustment out to an arc second because in the process of adjusting the opposite direction, Let's say you get the vertical adjustment out to an arc second. In the process of trying to get the horizontal motion out, you can expect some small changes in the vertical. So you just work them in until they're comparably working in. And that's how we do it. Okay.